to say, as Francis Fukuyama did over 20 years ago, now, that we've got to the end of history, that every country in the world was, will soon become a social democracy. It's just not true, because there is always a tyrannical impulse in certain people. And if those people get in charge of the state and get in charge particularly of an armed force, then the rest of us have a problem. So it's saying, never take it for granted that everyone's going to live happily ever after, because democracy is not permanent. But the other thing I wanted to do with this book was to show that so much of history doesn't tell the truth about what happened. It may set out the facts, and facts that are indisputable in many cases, but it doesn't always tell you the reason why those facts came about. It doesn't always say, this happened because a country was very greedy, or the people who ran this country were determined to impose their will on others. Um, I would make an exception of that for the extensive and very good studies of Nazism. It seems that Hitler, who was certainly not a very nice man, um, is almost unique in history in, in having his complete ruthlessness exposed in this way. But you rarely read a history, say, of um, the Spanish Empire that says the Spanish were just downright greedy and wanted to oppress what they regarded as primitive peoples and steal all their money. Um, it's always dressed up as being uh, the fruits of exploration and um, broadening horizons and attempting to civilize them by making them Roman Catholics. Now, there may be an element of truth in that, but this book, I'm afraid, is a rather cynical book, and it does say that there are quite often quite low reasons why people want to do this. In our own times, you have Al-Qaeda, which although they are fundamental Islamicists, uh, they are effectively a political ideology more than a, re a religious one. So if, if you like, they are continuing the great theme that's been around since the days of, uh, of Marx and Engels and through Nietzsche and Hitler and Mao and Stalin and all those people, that the control of a state and its people is important because those people must follow a certain ruling ideology. That determination to control people that comes with uh, the assertion of religious doctrine or the assertion of an ideology, that um, basic lust for money and wealth um, to make a country rich at the expense of, not through fair trade, but just simply through going and nicking all its nat natural resources. Um, and the determination just to have as much land as you can, to make it difficult for your enemies to get anywhere near you. Now those are the f to my mind, the four basic reasons why history has always changed course. If people want to write to me and tell me that there are others, I'd be very glad to hear them. But um, I, in the four years or so it took me to prepare to write this book, uh, I went through history of, uh, of Europe, of Africa, of, of the Far East, and of America. And almost every, ch well, every change in history I could come across fitted into one of those four categories. Power has always to an extent, existed on coercion. Uh, I suppose the thing that's changed in, in modern times is there is this community of the world that, that says, actually, we have our own nation states. They're all entitled to their own self-determination, and coercion is not acceptable. So the idea of a state now going and imposing its ideology, its religion, or just simply its people upon another power in order to extract money out of them and to get their territory. That's no longer acceptable. I'm just saying to people, when you read a history book and you read about a great change in the course of world history, it's usually not for the reasons that you're being told, if indeed you're being told reasons. I mean, very few history books, I'm afraid, actually do go into the details. There is usually a very basic cause, and this is why history repeats itself, because those basic causes, like the primal urges that men and women have, they come back again and again and again. Well, if I look at the bibliography of this book, um, even though it's a very short book, it's, it is quite a long bibliography, and um, those are only the books from which I took direct information. There was probably as many again um, that I'd read that just simply were stored at the back of my mind and I didn't actually quote an example from. Um, and I could have written the book of 350,000 words on this, which I think people would have got rather bored by. I could have gone and sat and done some specific manuscript work, which would have expanded the book even further. When you're asked to contain it to within, what is it, 160 pages, uh, or about 40,000 words, you've really got to sharpen your arguments. You've got to think, well, what do I want to say? What are the basics of my argument? And how do I address it? So all this book is, it's an introduction 
that sets out um, what I'm going to say. There are then four chapters on each of the four reasons why I think history has changed. And there's a conclusion that looks forward, in which I attempt, um, I'm sure, very wrongly to predict what the next great developments in world history might be uh, on the basis of my idea that history does always repeat itself.